session on design thinking. Everyone can see my screen now, right? Again? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So I am your mindset champion today. That's what we like to call ourselves here. Uh, my name is Sarah Alt. Uh, you can see here we have two very active kids in our household. Our daughter is a high school dancer and our son is a middle school baseball and basketball player. This means we spend a lot of time on the road going to and from practices, games, competitions, and tournaments. And since they were babies, traveling 50 minutes one way down the road with me to their daycare center, they have been great road trip companions for us. Uh, one of my favorite activities on the road is to think about different ways that we can uh, either come up with new products and services or how we might improve the ones that we use every day. And sometimes they are Sometimes we come up with like some pretty serious kid problems for my daughter. Like I need to invent a kite that doesn't get stuck in the tree. That's a great kid problem to solve. Some of the silliest ideas will come from these discussions. Like my son once suggested, wouldn't it be nice if they could put pizza in the engine so the cars in front of you at least smell good instead of bad. Uh, when he was six, he said, if I were you, I'd invent something that picks up all the toys around here. And I responded, they already have that. It's called a six-year-old boy with two missing front teeth. Burn. So now that they're older, and thankfully the discussions are still just as silly, but they're also quite insightful and very inclusive when we talk about them, especially as they get older, they come up with these new ideas and, and they learn so many new things and apply them to their ideas. And we re remind each other that at the early stages of thinking through these ideas and brainstorming, the more ideas you have on the table, the more likely you are to find a great one. So today, I'm excited to be here with you and for the next two sessions on design thinking to help you get all those great ideas on the table and bring the best ones to life. As a reminder, we are, we are recording these sessions for you to play back. Sometimes I go quickly, um, or if you miss anything and you can come back and you can share it with others. If you are comfortable doing so, please turn your camera on. We welcome to see you uh, when you can. If you're not uncomfortable, we understand. It's okay to leave it off. Either way, please remain on mute. So if you could take a few seconds to find that mute button, because I can still hear a little bit of feedback in the background that will really help. Um, there won't be a ton of uh, opportunity necessarily to, to, um, to speak during these sessions. We're going to use the chat window that will just kind of, again, cut down on that. It doesn't mean that we don't want to engage you or be involved in conversation. It's just... Um, it will help cut down on the noise, but definitely get ready for those chat windows because we're gonna we're gonna work through some things over chat. Um, we will have at least one break depending upon where it falls within the within the two hours. So um, so hopefully I can honor that for us. And if you have any questions or comments as we go along, feel free to use the chat window at any time. I may not be watching it. Um, all the time, but I know Kieran will help um, to watch. And Kieran, I invite you that if you see any questions in there or somebody's going, hold up, I, I want to say something, just feel free to cut me off. Um, yes. We have no problem with that. Okay. Um, so right out of the gate, let's get warmed up in that chat window right now. So go ahead and find that chat window in Zoom, if you would. I'll give you a few seconds. And we've got a pop quiz here. Does anybody recognize who this historical icon of innovation is? Let's see if I can check the chat window easily. Ah, there we go. Yes, you are correct. That sure is Thomas Edison. Okay, good job. Nice job. Um, Sorry, let me get back to my windows. I gotta lose that. Give me just one second here. It's coming back. 
Okay. So yes, sure enough, that is uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, and we have a little bit more. So he's known um, for the Edison light bulb. We have a little bit more that you might not have known about Thomas Edison. So with the 2020 presidential election coming up soon, Edison's first patented machine and one of his biggest flops actually is well worth examining. At the age of 22, the man that would go on to have just over a thousand patents to his name during his lifetime was actually a lowly telegraph operator who had recently been fired from his job at Western Union for tinkering with a lead acid battery on the job. And it turns out that the battery leaked sulfuric acid onto the floor irreparably damaging it. And the, the event itself actually propelled Edison to work on what would become his first patented invention, a machine which recorded the ballots of would-be voters with the help of a simple switch and electric current. At the time, this uh, allowed Edison to lay claim to the first patent for a voting machine. It was actually a pretty hot ticket. People in government recognized actually having representatives say I or nay one by one with a scribe telling up the votes by hand was not the best approach. Edison's plan was to speed up the process with a machine, which he named the electrographic vote recorder, that could allow le uh, legislators to vote with the flip of a switch. One end would signify a yes vote and the other a no vote and deliver the information via electronic current to a main recorder which would dispense the votes into two columns. And then the legislators would feed a piece of paper through the machine and it would print uh, the votes using a chemically treated paper for everyone to see. So Edison beat his competitors to the punch or at least to the patent office with this and was issued official US copyright on his device number 90,646 on June 1st, 1869. Unfortunately, the machine might have been a bit too ahead of its time. A fellow colleague named DeWitt Roberts purchased an interest on the patent for the sum of $100, which is about $1,750 with today's inflation. Edison's colleague took it to the nation's capital, showcasing it to all the members of Congress in Washington, D.C. to display its viability, fully expecting it would be well embraced, right? And the response? The chairman of the committee scoffed. If there's any invention on earth that we don't want down here, that is it. And in the end, Edison design, Edison's design remained unused, collecting dust in the patent office. So even though we know Edison for the Edison light bulb, many other inventions, this particular one actually flopped. So despite the fact that his first patent failed to make its mark on the American landscape, if his later inventions are any indication, his saying that I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work, still sticks today. So in addition to the Edison light bulb, here are three products that you will recognize. You know that they're successful. So of course the light bulb is an easy way to bring light to a dark room with just a flip on or off of the switch. Before Starbucks, there was no guarantee that you could get a coffee just the way you like it within three to five minutes. And did you know that a Starbucks barista can serve you a caffeinated drink in any one of 87,000 different ways, making it almost certain that you will get coffee just the way you want it? And did you know that others around you, um, or maybe you don't yourself have an iPhone, but others around you might have them. And so we recognize um, how uh, how innovative iPhones are as well. So all three of these products have gone through and have um, many of the four characteristics of good design in highly successful products. These solve a new need or an old need in a new way. If you look at the iPhone or the Edison bulb, they perform well, they get the job done. The Edison bulb is pretty straightforward, pretty simple um, on or off and even um, you know, the Starbucks as a product or as a service performs well, doesn't cost a lot to do it, and you can count on them to work. Edison would also say, I will never invent a product that no one wants, and design thinking is how you bring products or services that people actually want. 
And what's interesting about innovation and what excites me so much about design thinking is it reminds us that innovation can be in a lot of places. You don't necessarily have to come up with something like the Edison light bulb from so many years ago. I personally am a bit obsessed with two things in my life, packaging and road construction. And I know that's kind of a weird combination, but hang with me. So a few years ago, I gave online grocery delivery a try. And this is how the box of Cheerios arrived um, to my home. So you can see, this isn't really a good experience. And the question that I asked is, how might we change the old way of packaging cereal to be better uh, for, for grocery delivery? Right around the same time, the makers of Tide took on this problem with various packaging designs. In the middle image, we have a package, whoops, sorry. In the middle image, we have a package that integrates the at-home delivery box with the function of the container itself. In the image on the far right, we're looking at a vessel that could be refilled many times, so it even takes out the cardboard packaging as a necessity. Now, the one on the right didn't actually make it to market, but the ideas behind that and the ideation, similar to Edison's ideas, some of them make it, some of them don't. But the ideas and the, the stretching our thinking um, to innovating on the question, how might we get the job done better? Or how might our customers get the job done better? Uh, are important questions that we asked. Here's a, here are some more examples. In terms of understanding your customers really well, because if you understand your customers and how they measure value, that might also affect how you design. And that could be the design of the product, or again, in my case, because I'm obsessed with packaging, uh, how we might design the packaging. So here are two examples of how makeup is packaged in the beauty industry. The pictures on the left are a product from the makers of Olay, one that I actually used to use, because you see that picture in the middle, is the empty and used package of my, of my own. So notice the before and after pictures of a fully used product on the left. Any consumer of this product, myself included, would feel that they got every bit of value out of the almost $11 per fluid ounce that's involved in the, or that, that, um, that this product costs. And on the right, this is a vessel that has survived many decades of delivering mascara, which is the stuff that ladies put on their eyelashes in case you don't know. Um, and any consumer of this product would feel they get that, that whatever is left inside of there, they wouldn't know for sure. You can't see it. Um, has, is, is there anything left? Is it dried out? So, and this is a product recommended to be replaced every three months, regardless of how much is left inside. At almost $50 per fluid ounce. I know for ladies out there, like, have you ever done the math? on how much you're paying per fluid ounce for that, at best, it leaves us frustrated. So yet there is no better way to buy mascara today. There's nothing out there. This is, this is still the packaging vessel that has survived decades. So let's take a little bit of a detour from retail and packaged goods. See what I did there, detour? You guys staying on top of this? Somebody got, all right, there we go. I see, I see people got that. All right, so into my other, play, other favorite place for innovation, which is road building and construction. The world's oldest known paved road was constructed in Egypt sometime between 2600 and 2200 BC. You would have thought we stopped innovating by now, but there's still so much ideation to come. Really successful ideas can come from taking something that already exists and imagining how we might make it safer. I know roundabouts can be sometimes annoying. We're seeing a lot of them popping up around here in Southeastern Wisconsin, totally get it. One of my favorite podcasts from Stuff You Should Know is all about roundabouts. While most US residents are still kind of getting used to them today, rotaries have been around since the end of the 18th century. Among other benefits, roundabouts reduce, con reduce congestion and conflict points they force drivers to approach with more caution and slower speeds to reduce the overall impact of collisions. And they challenge the long held belief of how traffic should flow. Simply put, roundabouts were invented to make it safer to pass through intersections. So the innovation here is how might we make the product or the service or the thing, the good, uh, safer. 
do any of you ride bikes in the cities? Okay, yep. So especially now, we've been doing a lot of that, right? Um, getting fresh air and getting out and we can't get into our workout centers. So we've been riding bikes a lot. We've been out walking a lot. So let's watch a video on how we might make it safer to do so. Let me make it a little bit bigger here. Give me just one moment. Urban planners and designers have finally figured it out. If your city is designed so that you can bike instead of drive, it will be a happier, healthier place to live. We know that protected bike lanes are the key to getting the average person to consider traveling by bike. Sharing busy traffic lanes with cars is absolutely unacceptable, and by a line of paint is often not enough. Protected by... Okay, hold on. I'm going to get back to that. Um, let's go back. If you, if you click on the, that, high, that uh, dashed box, it'll go bigger. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's just that it's right there, right there, right next to the gear. Right yeah, next to it's the gear. blocked. It's blocked from my view. So I'm going to try to get to it really quickly here. Click on the box right next to the gear. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. There you go. Urban planners right. and designers have finally figured it out. If your city is designed so that you can bike instead of drive, it will be a happier, healthier place to live. We know that protected bike lanes are the key to getting the average person to consider traveling by bike. Sharing busy traffic lanes with cars is absolutely unacceptable, and separation by a line of paint is often not enough. Protected bike lanes, also called cycle tracks, use curbs, planters, or parking to buffer bicyclists from moving cars. But there's still a problem. The protected bike lanes lose their benefits when they reach intersections. The buffer falls away, and you're faced with an ambiguous collection of green paint, dashed lines, and bicycle markings. One popular configuration is called a mixing zone, where cars and bikes share the lane. It doesn't matter how safe and protected your bike lane is if intersections are risky, stressful experiences. We need to make intersections just as safe and secure as the lanes that lead into them. What the protected bike lane needs is the protected intersection. Modeled after Dutch intersection design, the protected intersection brings the physical protection along with you as you ride through the crossing. A collection of design elements makes left turns simple and secure, right turns protected and fast, and provide straight through movements that minimize or eliminate conflict from turning cars. With this design, riders will never feel stranded, exposed, or unsure of where to go and how to get there. There are four main elements to protected intersection designs. A corner refuge island, a forward stop bar for bicyclists, a setback bike and pedestrian crossing, and bicycle-friendly signal phasing. The corner refuge island is the key element that makes these intersections function. This island brings the protective barrier from the bike lane far into the intersection. Think of it like a curb extension for bicyclists. The island physically separates bicyclists as they make right turns and provides a secure refuge for those waiting at a red signal protected from moving cars. Paired with the corner refuge island is a forward stop bar for bicyclists. While people driving must stop back behind the crosswalk, people on bikes may yield to pedestrians and stop at a waiting area farther ahead in the intersection. Bicyclists turning left also use this space to wait when making a left turn. The advantage of this design is threefold. The forward stop location makes bicyclists incredibly visible to drivers waiting at a red light. The physical distance ahead of cars gives bicyclists an effective head start when the light turns green and the distance of the road that bicyclists need to cross is greatly reduced. In protected intersections, the bike lane bends away from the intersection, creating a setback bicycle and pedestrian crossing. In contrast to conventional bicycle crossings that run next to moving cars, the setback crossings provide the space and time for everyone to react to potential conflicts. The critical dimension is one car length of space between the traffic lane and the bicycle crossing around six meters. This space is often already present in the parking and buffer space of the protected bike lane. 
With this design, drivers turn 90 degrees to face the bike lane before they even cross it, making people on bikes highly visible and out of the driver's blind spot. To allow for adequate reaction time for all users, use a small effective corner radius to encourage a slow driver turning speed of 5 to 10 miles per hour. The last element of a protected intersection is the use of bicycle-specific signals and bicycle-friendly signal phasing. Just as important as the physical design of the intersection is the use of signals to control how and when different people can proceed. At its most secure, a protected signal phase for bicyclists will use red signals to prevent any conflicting car turning movements. There is no risk of right or left hooks from cars when they are prohibited from turning while bicyclists are traveling through. A variation of the protected signal phase is to give all car movements a red signal and all bicyclist movements a green. This simultaneous green phase gives full reign of the intersection to bicyclists, allowing through movements in all directions at once, left turns in one stage, and even full U-turns through the intersection. Even at high volumes, bicyclists are good at negotiating shared space and will have no trouble staying out of each other's way. When it's not possible to prohibit conflicting movements entirely, an alternate approach is to provide a leading bicycle interval. This is a head start green light for bikes of anywhere from two to five seconds. It provides them a little extra time to get rolling, enter the intersection, and maybe even clear it completely before people driving start to move. Taken together, these design elements create a safe, clear experience for all people using the street. Signals control movements, refuge islands create protected spaces, and proper positioning of crossings and conflict points provides everyone with the time and space necessary to react to potential risks. While the protected intersection design is unconventional and non-standard in the U.S., so were protected bike lanes only a few years ago. Using these design concepts, planners, designers, and engineers can bring the protection of their bike lane into the space where people need it the most, and finally provide a safe place for people of all ages and abilities to ride. Learn more online with footnotes and references at protectedintersection.com. Okay. Pretty cool. Okay, can you still see my slides? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, okay, so a couple things that to just now, now I get excited about road construction and and pedestrian traffic, but multiple times this video referred to design and design elements, talked about users, about the human beings on the bikes being sort of at the center of these ideas. Um, even understanding bicyclists in some ways by saying bicyclists, bic bicyclists are good at negotiating space and turns with each other, right? Which is like this um, sort of when you when you think of bicyclists or if you are yourself, you realize, yeah, I guess we do kind of make eye contact and people kind of figure out who's going to go to the right and who's going to go to the left, right? And then they even talked about at the end, the narrator talks about the fact that sometimes we take unconventional and non-standard uh, approaches. These ideas were unconventional and non-standard for the U.S., but they had been worked out in other in other countries. And so too were some of the ideas like roundabouts that have been around for a long time. And we work them out, we figure them out, we find ways to adapt to them. And most importantly, having users and, and human beings at the center of those designs. So here's another way to imagine what that experience of bicycling uh, through, or in this case, over an intersection might look like.
Okay, give me one. Yeah, you know two. where this is. This, oh, I'm sorry, I should have said that, thank you. Um, this is in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands where um, the other narrator had mentioned a lot of innovation um, comes from the Dutch in, um, in bicycling because we're talking about a, you know, a country where there's more bikes uh, than people, right? And so a lot of innovation has come um, in terms of pedestrian traffic and especially bicycling traffic from a country like the Netherlands because they, they were forced to innovate um, because that's what their population asked for. That's what their population needed, right? Um, give me just one second. I gotta bring up my... Um, you guys can still see my slides, right? Yes. Okay, give me just one second. Bring up my notes. Okay, we're back. Okay, so innovation and great ideas come, can come in the form of combinations as well. And you can see in this case, in these videos and what we were talking about here is that the product may be uh, the product or the service or the intention may be uh, the roads. It may be the, the way in which we are transporting um, people safely. And we have something that we may be able to combine with something else. In the second video, we saw almost what looked like a roundabout, right? But it was a floating roundabout and it was up above, uh, up above the, the, the normal car um, traffic. So there's an example of where we can reconfigure an existing thing like a roundabout and make it better. Was there a question or a comment? No, okay. All right, so usually when people come up with a concept or a business idea, they start with questions like, how can I make it? Will it work? How much an in initial investment is needed? What, how much will it cost? How much can I sell it for? And how many of those widgets can I sell? While these are important questions that determine the feasibility of the product and the financial viability of the business model, when these questions are answered honestly and acted upon appropriately, there's about a 40% chance that a profitable, profitable business will emerge. But there's a problem with this approach. The creator of the product has a personal bias. The creator really likes what he or she has created and, think, and thinks that basically everybody will love it. But what if it's a product or a service that people don't even care about? It will likely fail. So we need a third essential criteria for success. So let's review them. Business model viability is where the dollars and the cents make sense. Is there a business model that shows that value is generated for at least one party and something can be exchanged for that value? The most common exchange of value, of course, is money. Second one is feasibility, engineering feasibility. Can you create a consistent high quality product or service in a sufficient quantity at optimum cost in a reasonable time? Those are the two that we talked about that make dollars and cents. The third part that, that is essential is, is the product or service truly desirable by customers? In his book, Change by Design, Tim Brown calls this the innovation sweet spot. Tim reminded us, you can change your price and find suppliers that will change their prices to have a lot of influence on feasibility and viability. Therefore, it makes the most sense to focus in a place where price does not impact as much decision, decision making. It's in the desirability of the product or service. Think about it. How many times have you or someone you asked, how could we possibly justify paying $600 to $1,000 or more for, an, for a phone? Apple is on track to sell to its two billionth iPhone sometime in 2021 or 2022 at that kind of price. So if the product is desirable, price can sometimes be justified. The founders of design thinking worked with great organizations like Apple to perfect this approach. And now many practitioners all over the world start with design first. They design for the customer. So this is the clinical definition of design thinking, which is how we carry out human-centered design, the discipline of developing solutions in the service of people. 
The idea is that humans will remember the design as an experience and they will come back, they will give back, or they'll recommend your product or service. Notice it doesn't tell us the how. There are many good ways um, that we use to, uh, to get to human-centered design, but the outcome is the most important. Humans will remember the design as an experience. How we get there is the techniques and questions we ask and answer to get to the outcome. Much of that is contained in design thinking. So if that's what design thinking looks like and, um, and it may not be how we've thought to do design, what has been? Kind of what, it, what is sort of the most common way if it's not design thinking? So it's usually what we call idea first thinking. This is the, the approach where somebody might say, hey, I have an idea. I'm gonna go and develop my solution. I'm gonna go make it perfect. I'm gonna reveal it for the world. And, and when I go to reveal, this is when I'm looking for validation. This is the first time that anyone other than the idea creator brings it to others and brings them up to speed on the idea. And then they go, after all of that, then they go and find a market. Let's go find my tar target market to accept my great idea. Notice how far into this idea first thinking or linear process finding a market and maybe even having a conversation with the market. If we go back to the innovation sweet spot, vi viability and will people even want it is so important to finding that sweet spot. And if you're an idea of first thinking or in linear thinking, it's a long time into that process before you're actually even testing its viability. And then of course there's the, now I get to unleash it to the world and let's cross our fingers and hope for the best. So in idea first thinking, the enthusiasm and excitement about the product or service kind of follows a similar cycle. It's this sine curve of, uh, you know, there's, there's all this great excitement when we're going through ideas and, and oh gosh, it's pretty painful to bring this to development, but we're gonna have to do it. We're gonna slug through it. So there's deep valleys of frustration and lack of interest, but then we gotta bring it back up. And so, even just the interest, excitement, or awareness of what the idea is follows that sine curve. Sometimes those ideas don't even come back out, out, of that, out of that deep trough. So bringing it back to excitement in each of the steps, if mostly, if not entirely, on the idea creator um, themselves to actually push it through, that, through those experiences. And that can be quite lonely um, when you're an innovator. What we like about design thinking is it's much more collaborative, much more circular in the way that it works. And also the breadth of where it applies, not just for products. Um, you know, anytime that I catch myself saying products, I, I, you'll hear me make sure to, to remind us that, it can, that design thinking can be applied to services as well, really, um, and, and, and processes, really anything where humans are interacting with the output or the outcome. Now, while this is depicted as a set of phases, we do not want you to mistake in this as being an orderly set of steps. It's both cyclical in that it tells us um, that we need to go back and potentially repeat. Um, and that repeating of the cycle may come at any time. You may get into empathizing and defining, and you may realize, wow, I you know, we got to go back to empathize because as we were getting into de defining what the opportunity is for the client, for the customer, we found a whole new customer group that we have to go re-empathize with. Likewise, if you get all the way to um, developing a prototype and you realize, wow, there's some things that we need to go back and ideate on or redefine the problem. So it's not meant to represent that even there's an, uh, uh, an order to the cycle, but that we go back in the phases, we, we may need to pause, um, abandon some ideas to dig deeper into any of these phases. And it's really a highly engaging, empathetic way to make sure that the customer or the user or the client or the constituent uh, is at the center of all you do, much more collaborative. And it's not as lonely um, as the idea of first thinking because depending upon how many people you get involved and how close your customer is to you as you're going through this process, they're much more along the way with you. Now, 
to be clear, this is not meant to also say that everybody's idea or that this is a yes design methodology, meaning that whenever your customers say, wouldn't it be nice if you added this feature or that feature that you have to say yes to everything, it is meant to make sure that you get those ideas on the table so that you know what they're looking for and then you can prioritize and decide. Otherwise, if you didn't have that conversation at all, you'd miss it. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, okay. The question reads, I assume the market research fits into the empathize phase. So you want to talk about market research versus uh, empathize? Yeah, so market research, um, it, it kind of depends on um, how, where you get the source, source of that market information is. What we like to do in empathize is actually have customers in the room with you actually asking some very important questions. And we'll go through those questions as an example um, for you. So it's live, it's in person, live, as live as it can be, it's live, it's in person. Um, market research is great. It's absolutely a version of getting empathized and getting um, uh, what, what customers are looking for. But remember, you are, aren't always in control of how that market study was conducted, okay? so we like to make sure that in addition to market research and um and you know either data that you um that you can buy or that you can subscribe to but we also like to make sure that you've had um, some control in how the questions are asked and in what types of questions and engaging in a dialogue and a conversation with your customers not just over surveys or or data gathering karen anything else to add there yeah, the market research tend to be a little bit more passive and biased. Uh, many times, uh, the biggest fault with market, uh, market research is that the innovator or originator of product has his or her own idea that are imposed on the survey itself. So best example for that one would be uh, General Motors uh, had a major market research. They spent almost, uh, I think, $100 million on that research to find out how can they make a better car. And the problem with that one is uh, the answers that they came back were really pointing out the features that were already available in the Japanese cars at that time. So because the way questions were asked, not really try to find out what empathy by empathizing with the users what they feel so the biggest difference between empathize is to really look at the complete you or complete user than just asking the random questions yeah that's a really good example and another thing that we like to do is is when we're asking the right question using karen's example is the assumption is the vehicle is what people want in order to transport them. What if the question we asked was completely different? What if a question was what the, what the customer or the user is trying to do is get from point A to point B safely and most efficiently, what features would they need in order to do that? Now, it still might, it still might cause people to think about cars and give answers to those questions thinking about cars, but you never know. Somebody might come up with something completely different that even if we, aren't ready to teleport people yet, or if we're not ready to use jetpacks yet, there might be a feature about jetpacks that would have never come out if we narrowed the thinking in the market study to just how can we make the car better, right? So it's a combination of being more in control of those questions. It does not mean that we're saying we don't use market research, right? But we just have to make sure that we know um, where, what, what, filters and biases even were in those market studies. And we, um, we make sure that you have an opportunity to talk with customers to, to weed those out. Okay, so another thing I really like about design thinking is how well it fits with the growth mindset and growth mindset thinking. You may be familiar with growth mindset if you are a student or have a student in your life right now. It is taking longer than, in my opinion, it should to be embraced in our professional lives. But instead of a fixed mindset that my first idea or my first design fails, I'm done, I'm punished, I got a bad grade, I'm reprimanded or ridiculed for, um, for this idea. 
That's linear thinking. Design thinking requires that you ask more questions. And the further that you get into your designs, the more questions you ask. And you iterate and you pivot. You go back to your definition of the problem. We go back to the ideas that Edison had, which is, look, I, it's OK if they fail, um, because failure is something that we learn from. You go back to your ideal customer or client. You learn from those failures, and you keep on going. So if you practice growth mindset, if you're familiar with growth mindset, design thinking will also feel, feel, feel familiar, OK? So let's take a pause. This isn't officially a break, but this is a pause because uh, what I've done is kind of brain dumped a lot of just a little bit of science and a little bit of art on you about what design thinking is. So open up those chat boxes. And let's just kind of test to, to see how well we are listening along the way and check our learning, okay? So real quick, is the design thinking process linear or is it circular? Good, excellent, circular, very good. Um, and who is at the center of our designs? Is it the inventor or the customer? Who's at the center? That's right, the customer, good job. Sometimes that's hard, right? Because in linear thinking, it was my idea, my idea is gonna be awesome. In design thinking, we're putting the customer, the client, the constituent. I realize that many of our designs may be processes or maybe services. And so um, whether it's a user or a client or a customer, they're at the center. Yep, and Jeff says product development must start with the need. And that's right. It starts with the need of whomever, the user, the client, the customer, whomever that is. And the more human that we can make that, um, the better. Okay, so let's start with empathize. So we're going to get into the phases. Today we cover empathize and define, and then in subsequent sessions we'll cover the rest, okay? So to empathize with someone in design thinking means that we're putting yourself in your customers or your clients or constituent shoes. Better yet, as we said earlier, we would actually have them right there with, with you at the table as you are going through your design uh, discussions. But you don't just have them there and give them a voice. You actually listen carefully and deeply. Um, it's not enough to just have them sitting in the room listening into and observing your design. It, you want them participating in that with you. We don't judge when we empathize, we listen. There will be plenty of time to prioritize or even disregard ideas from others later, but not when you're in empathy mode. And I think I mentioned earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean we're at this stage we're saying yes to everything, but we're also not necessarily um, disregarding um, the, the, the ideas. You also, when you're empathizing, you're recognizing the emotions and where this person is coming from, and you're realizing or working hard to make sure that you are taking the perspective of that person, uh, of that user or of that client or of that customer, um, and it's potentially a perspective that you had never taken before. Sometimes if you have the benefit of either already having a prototype or if you have a, pro a similar product or service in mind, sometimes you have the benefit of actually watching your client or customer using that. And then that's where you begin to pivot and iterate. iterate. So um, that's also another good way um, to do customer empathy. And then the most important thing in any empathized session is to communicate that you understand what they've said. So as a reminder, humans are at the center of our designs. They could be clients, customers, users, patients, employees, any one of those. One of our favorite stories actually comes from a home builder here in southeastern Wisconsin. They build semi-custom homes. They have uh, production home designs that they customize with their clients. So it's one of those builders where you can, you know, order the colonial or you can order the um, one particular type of house, and then you can um, customize it after that. And this ho particular home builder was a little bit frustrated that homeowners who were requesting custom changes were requesting those changes really late in the process. 
and or the customers were frustrated that the production home design didn't quite fit their needs. And we all know if you're familiar with home building or if you know somebody who has, custom changes can be pretty costly for clients. And the reasons for this builder felt kind of unusual. The architects and designers didn't understand why it would be so important to fit a grand piano and, and find a way to customize so late in the stage of the conversation with clients to fit a grand piano or a grandmother's china cabinet. But these were, and, and from their eyes, from the architect's eyes, these were material items that the client knew they had. So why couldn't they have expressed that early in the process that they needed a, that they needed a place for them? And the builder recognized that they weren't really just in the home or weren't in the business of home building. After they had enough of this experience working with clients, they began to realize we're in the process of moving lives to create new memories. So when they, when they reframed in an empathetic way that their customers and their clients were actually needing to move their memories into a new home, instead of asking questions early on in the customizing process of how many rooms, what size rooms do you want, they ask questions like, what memories do you want to take with you from where you live now? Think about that. If a builder asks you, what memories, what things do you want to take with you from where you live now? And asked you that early on in the process, you may, those clients certainly turned out to be the type that um, articulated that much earlier in the design process. And it helped the architects to, um, to not require so many custom changes at the end. So what they really did was focus on jobs that needed to be done instead of the actual product or service. Because if you just focused on the product, it would be, well, you could just accept the, the house that we had in the catalog for you. But what they asked is, what job is my customer or client or constituent needing to get done? Going back to some of my examples from earlier, the makers of Tide knew customers didn't want to go to retail stores to get their detergent. They wanted it delivered. That is the job to be done. The packaging designers and engineers of Olay Makeup knew customers wanted to get all of the product they paid for out of the package. They wanted the value out of the um, the investment. That was the job to be done. And the city planners in that city in Netherlands, or even in the um, example um, city for the bike lanes, knew that city plan or knew that drivers and bicyclists needed to get through intersections safely. That was the job to be done. So here's what I want you to do again. Open up those chat windows because I want you to practice answering this question for either the product or service that you're working on right now, or maybe a product or service that's sitting right in front of you. Um, just practice. What is the job that my customer or client or constituent is needing to get done? Chat me some of those answers. What job does the customer or user at the center of my design need to get done? And if you're not currently working on a product or service design, that's okay. Look at something that's on your desk or wherever you're sitting right in front of you, find a product or, or an innovation and say, and ask yourself, what was the job that that customer needed to, to get done? All right, so Jeff says, clean the house, change the oil. Great, keep them coming. Hmm. Arlene, polish my nails. Oh, yes. Very good. So you can see these are examples of relatively simple jobs to be done. To understand process deadlines, accurate answers. Good. Okay, so that is an example of something that we need to do as we think through our empathizing with our, with our customers is asking ourselves an important question, what job are they needing to get done? 
Okay, let's keep going. To really understand if that job to be done is important or meaningful, we need to lead with empathy. We talked about empathizing. Leading with empathy means taking someone's perspective and making it your own, even if it's only briefly to really understand why. To be clear, knowledge, just knowing your customers or constituents, knowing your market, anyone you serve, the, and just knowing that they have a problem or need is not the same thing as truly understanding them and what solving the job to be done means to them. What value will they put on getting that job done? How meaningful is it that they can get the job done? That is how we get to empathizing and really understanding, um, not just knowing, but understanding the value and how meaningful it is to get that job done. And remember our innovation sweet spot, how you design the product or service or experience is how you get to a desirable one. Now, so knowledge is not the same thing as understanding is basically what we have to remember. And this guy helps to illustrate it even better. Okay, so let's watch this video. Hey, it's me, Dad. Yeah, voice is not coming. Okay, hold on. So sound was not working on that one? Hold on. Started and then stopped. Huh. Okay, let's try, let me hit escape, hold on. Let's try staying in the slide. Let's see, if, because if it first started, it was probably when I was in the slide. So I'm gonna hit play again and stay within the slide. Let's try that. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how Is to do working? it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam and and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. <laughs> No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> All right, I'm just like, oh. All right, so, uh, whatever you're at, yeah. Wait, wait. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. <laughs> Dude, just 
Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> yes. I got it, got it, got it. I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it clicked. It. It clicked. Hold it, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Good. Okay, I can run a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me, and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes, and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yes. You think I'm faking. You don't believe me. That looks so Actually. weird to like, no, 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 no. You think I'm lying, don't you? Yeah, I don't I'm not lying. <laughs> I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things, because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. OK, if you want to support Smarter Every Day, you can. OK, so. Let's bring this back up here. Give me one second. Okay, so one of my one of my biggest takeaways from 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 this 
was this idea that I can't remove the cognitive bias. All I could do was redesignate it. And it's reminding us that also that knowledge is not the same thing as understanding. And I think it also challenges, uh, challenges us to think about our own ways in which we view a problem or a solution may be different than somebody else who's experiencing it from another perspective. So again, to support our ideas and our, our need to make sure that we're empathizing and that we have um, the customer's perspective and the user's perspective at the center of those designs. Now, one of the ways that we do that uh, to help facilitate focus on that um, customer is the empathy map. And some of you may recognize this um, publicly available um, through a number of different sources. When you Google it, empathy map canvas, you'll find all kinds of places where you can get this image um, to be used. But we start here because we really need to embed empathy into the behaviors and the fabric of how and why we exist to serve whomever those clients are. You could, for example, print this in regular paper size or even poster size, work in pencil or with sticky notes if you're working on posters, anything that allows you the flexibility, and then bring a customer or a user into your discussion, bring a friend or a family member, a coach or a mentor, work, work through Empathy Map Canvas with others. It's not good enough to just work this um, yourself. You really need to understand your customer or your user your client, as well as, or even in some cases better than if you can, they even understand themselves. And then you always go back to this map to make adjustments and recheck it throughout the life cycle to make sure you aren't missing something in your designs or your solutions or your ideas. So this is so important that we're actually gonna practice it ourselves, okay? So we're gonna stay with this theme about, um, we're gonna stay with this theme about pedestrians and bikers and, and sort of these, um, the cities that we live in. And we're gonna practice empathy by listening to the people of Poynton. Now, Poynton is a town in the UK that needed a way to improve traffic flow for many reasons, which you'll discover as you watch. Now, this is a two minute video. So um, get your, like if you have a piece of paper or something that you can just jot down some things on the side, or if you can remember, through a two minute video, that's great too. But what I want you to listen very carefully for, because after the video, I'm gonna ask you to chat your answers to these. There's all of these really important questions and almost, you will have an answer probably for almost all of these in just a two minute listen to the, um, to the people of Poynton. What do the people of Poynton think and feel? What do they see? What do they say and do? What do they hear? What are their pains and what are their gains? These last two, what are their pains and what are their gains? These are very important. When you're able to write down the pains and the gains for your customer or client, you begin to find value for them. Remember when we talked about desirable products and services, who would desire something? Who would want something that either eliminates their pains or brings them gains? Probably all of us would, right? If it, if it eliminates my pains or brings them gains, that's how we get to desirability. Okay, so I'm gonna have us watch this video. Hopefully this one we can watch in full screen. Um, double check me on the audio. And then jot down some of these answers. Uh, and while you're doing that, I'm gonna bring up another screen um, that, that I'll share. And we're gonna practice actually doing an empathy map, okay? All right, so let's give this a whirl. Let's get this video going. And you let me know if we can still hear audio. Okay, just a pause. Can you hear audio? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm going to start playing now. Pay attention to, like I said, all those important questions. What do they think and feel? What do they see? What do they hear? What do they say and do? What are their pains and what are their gains? Okay, here we go.
at the moment. I've worked here for about 10 years and it's been the same all the time. Having to cross one lot of traffic lights, then to wait for the other set of traffic lights. Traffic's coming from you all angles, turning left, right, it's horrendous. It's a very busy junction. Obviously the main arterial route is London Road South to North and vice versa. It's not the safest of junctions. We do have a, quite a number of accidents here. If I'm trying to cross the roads and I get stuck in the islands with my pram, that's a little bit dangerous, especially the traffic goes quite fast sometimes. So as it is now, the, the junction's pretty catastrophic. Over the years, the increase in traffic and the steps taken to try to deal with that have changed this place from being the heart of the village into being merely a traffic signal controlled wasteland. Of course, what it does is to cut off one half of the village from the other. So people who live over here on the west side have to cross four lanes of traffic to get to the high street. People can now buy all their goods and services from out of town superstores or off the internet there's no functional necessity to come into Poynton at all. We're here to revitalise the village centre. The status quo isn't really an option. You can see how bad it is now. We've got to do something. We looked at pedestrianisation, we looked at opening up side roads, and everything we looked at didn't actually do anything for Poynton. It just moved traffic faster. OK, now... I spared you the remaining 12 minutes of the video. Uh, I do encourage you if this sounds like something interesting, I'm not expecting you to love road construction as much as I do, but definitely watch the rest of the video so you can see sort of the outcome of the design. That first two minutes was all about listening and, and, and empathizing, okay? So I'm gonna momentarily just stop my share because I wanna reshare a different window for you, which is where I'm gonna bring up this empathy map. While I'm doing that, you guys get your chat windows open, grab your thoughts together because we're going to just practice for a few minutes doing an empathy exercise, okay? So give me just one moment while I stop share here and I'm gonna share a different screen. Okay, so this, can you all see the empathy map canvas now? I can't see you, so somebody give me a verbal, please. Yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you, Karen. Okay, so this one looks a little different than um, just visually than sort of the official empathy map canvas, but that's okay because as you can see, this is quite simple. You could draw this on a, sh on a sheet of paper. You don't have to print it, you don't have to go get the official. The point is that you ask the right questions and that you go through the exercise, okay? So I like to do this myself in, in mural. Um, this is where I get to work through these online um, as an example with clients. But like I said, you don't necessarily have to, to, to feel like you have to do it all digital, okay? So let's give this a whirl. What, let's talk about the people of point and remember that what they're trying to do is get through their, um, let's say that we're a biker and we're trying to get through that safely, through that village safely. What do you think, or what do, what do the people of Poynton think and feel about where they are right now? What do they think and feel? I'll bring up the chat window here so I can see a couple of examples. What do they think and feel? All right, good, Riley, confused and scared. Okay, let's drop that one up here. Confused and scared. Unsafe. Yep. Okay, good. All right, how about, let's go over here. What do they see? What do they see around them? They see danger. What else do they see? Really get into those senses now, right? What do they see? Heavy traffic. Good. What do you suppose they might see? Uh, this, I'm, this is a leading question a little bit because in the two minutes I showed you, um, you don't know this for sure. What do you think they see in other villages potentially? Do you think they see potentially safer intersections elsewhere? Harmony, yep, agreed. Okay, so 
the what they what do they see is not just about what do they see in their environment right now, but it also might be what do they see someplace else? Because remember our knowledge and our understanding and our awareness or our biases, uh, that can creep into our designs where somebody says, well, I just want it the way that the village down the road does it. Don't, don't try to solve this anything differently. Just give me exactly what that village down the road has, right? And sometimes that's okay. Other times that may limit our designs, right? All right. How about what do they say and do? Some of my favorites right at the beginning there. Did you hear some of the things they said? What were the words that they actually used when they described what it's like to be there? Do you remember those? They were right at, many of them were right at the beginning. Anybody got one? Overwhelming, yep, I heard that word too, yep. Busy, mm hmm And I think I heard, you know, right away at the beginning, frustrating, unsafe, right? Good. All right, now, oops. Let's go over to what do they hear? And this can be the physical here, right? So what did we hear? I actually had to turn my volume button down a little bit at the beginning because it's loud, right? What did they hear? Noise, more specific, what kind of noise? Horns beeping, yep, good. Cars speeding, yep. Um, I, I thought it was kind of ironic. I don't know if you all heard it, but um, when the when the guy at the end was talking and he was on camera, it was almost as if somebody purposefully, right, sped up just so they could be heard um, to really drive home the point, right? Okay, good job. All right, now let's keep going. What about pains? Okay, what do, and it's okay to repeat some of these, but really think about now, what is, what are their pains? What are their pains, their fears, their frustrations with the way it is today? It's okay to repeat, get to those real deep pains. Yeah, feeling out of control. Somebody earlier said like literally fearing your life, right? Oh, there it is. Good, Diana. Fear Fear of accident happening or someone being killed, right? That's a legit fear, right? So we gotta make sure. Now, the other thing is I, I, I felt, and I, I know a little bit behind the story because I've seen the whole, the whole video, but there's also an obstacle here. And there was one subtle one in there that, you know, I never really had an appreciation for until I saw this video. Um, and it was when the gentleman was talking about the fact that people, you know, don't have to stop in this village anymore. They don't even have to shop here. Yeah, there you go. Say lost business, flat out lost business. Okay. It's a real fear when people don't have to stop in the village anymore to go to the bakery. They just drive on through. This isn't a destination. This is a place where people, it's a thoroughfare to get to, I believe it was um, Manchester. Okay. Um, what about their gains? So what do they, what do they want out of this? And, and the easy way is to kind of flip those pains into gains. So fearing our life is a pain. So saving our lives or not losing our lives would be a gain, but let's think about it in terms of measures of success. As an example here, what would be measures of success if we were to design this in a better way? Any thoughts on, on how we would word measures of success. Okay, good, confidence in, in using or in going through. What else? Yep, fewer accidents, there you go. So fewer accidents is something we can measure. Yeah, having people want to, so, you know, people actually spend money and time in, in the town, okay. Good. All right. Good job practicing, you guys. This, um, this is exactly how we would want to go through uh, the empathize stage 
of your designs. And what we had the benefit of here as an example is two minutes of users or villagers or, or townspeople that could tell us exactly what was going on in their minds. And so in that case, um, it was very inclusive and collaborative. And that's one of the things you want to make sure that you're doing when you bring people into these empathy exercises is, um, is it's okay to really tell us how you think and you feel and what you hear and all of those great things that are part of this um, empathized process because we've got to get that out on the table. Okay, good job. Uh, let's see where we're at. Okay, I have to momentarily stop sharing. Give me a moment here. And I will share back to our deck. Good job, thank you. Okay. Oh, perfect. Just in time for our five minute break. Actually, we can make this a little bit longer. We're gonna make this one a seven minute break. Okay, because we're, we're doing good on time. You guys are super participative, but I also wanna give you a little bit of a break. So I'm gonna send my, set my timer for seven minutes on my phone. I start when the timer goes off. So, um, so please make sure you're back. If you, uh, just as a reminder, if you're not sure what you're gonna be doing during that seven minutes, you might wanna mute that camera or shut that camera off, um, but make sure to turn it back on when you come back. And the timer is going to start right now. That was good. Good. Yeah, you can pause recording too if you want. That's up to you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do it. Fine. And then that that will take us through the end of this session. We're going to do another practice on define, um, and then we'll wrap it up for the day today, and then um, and then prepare for next week. So. The next phase of this is defining the problem or the opportunity based on all that great uh, empathetic listening that we practice. So uh, in the activity we did just before the break, you were all invited to participate. Now, we may not have taken all of your ideas and just to keep things shortened, or some of you may not um, have chatted, and that's okay. Um, and sometimes what happens when you get into those sessions is some people participate more than others, or you may have thought that your idea didn't um, didn't either get voiced or that it, it didn't make it onto the onto the board. So one of the behaviors that is most important design thinking and effective brainstorming is practicing what we call yes and. It actually comes from improv. So if you're familiar with the improv, there's there's entire skits and and um, and fun um, situations that are all around this idea of practicing yes and. And it's really to get away from this idea of but, or that's not going to work here, or, um, you know, or even flat out saying no, uh, and then moving on. And because that's um, not inclusive, that's not how we get people to feel good about um, even crazy, wacky ideas, right, and get them out onto the table. So inclusive brainstorming really creates a space where Everyone gets an equal chance to state their ideas. They're all valuable um, because we're so early on in the in the process that um, assigning value isn't even possible at this point. And because we're not passing judgment, people are more willing to take risks with their ideas. No one dominates or should dominate or shut down ideas because this is why um, really people are very careful um, in in the beginning. It's because they, if they feel like they're not their ideas aren't going to be accepted they're less likely to share them. So we don't want them. We want crazy, wild, or, or, um, or, or any of these ideas that will spark someone else. Even something crazy or wild, even though you'd say that would never work here, uh, by practicing yes and, you can bring that idea and reframe that idea to something that maybe is more, um, more practical. And it's more collaborative because, again, we all think we don't um, have to necessarily be an artist uh, to think like a designer. Just the fact that we all think and have these ideas makes it, um, makes it much more collaborative. So to be clear, yes and behavior doesn't mean we say, I've said this a couple of times now, so I got to repeat this because it's so important. It doesn't mean we say yes to everything that people suggest. When it comes time to act, 
we still need to pick a path and that's okay. But this behavior is meant to get you there with more inclusive practices. There's also some, some brain science in this, okay? So when you train your brain to say yes first, you get commitment that you're open to it. Saying yes first you, means you begin to see the positive rather than the negative reaction that shuts down all other possible considerations. So if you're, if you're the innovator, if you're the one with the idea, it's so important for you to um, uh, encourage yes and thinking. If you're a participant in somebody else's designs or participant in, um, in that process, so important um, to make sure that you feel uh, that you can make a commitment to, um, to being open to, to all of those ideas, okay? So with this newly reframed opportunity uh, in mind, let's now construct the very important human-centric dis design statement. So this is another essential in our process. You don't even necessarily need the official template, although we, um, we supply that here for you uh, as an example, because it's really straightforward and easy. You can, again, draw this on a piece of paper, draw it up on a poster, or you can go out um, and Google human-centric design statement. You can get a few different examples of how to, how to frame this statement. We do not proceed though, the, the, the very important thing is we do not proceed without a clear understanding of what that statement is. Also, in this case, we notice that we don't define it using solutions. We don't say, this is the way we're going to do it. That does the, that's at the stage that we're at yet. That would be too narrow and it would already be biased. For example, how many times have we heard, I need an app for that? Well, fine, um, that's a solution though. And if nobody's gonna use it, why bother developing an app? So what we wanna make sure when we're doing um, human-centric design statements is that, is that we start with um, making sure that we've identified who the person is, uh, we've named them, in, uh, back in your market research or otherwise, some of you maybe even do customer segmentation or you do persona mapping where you actually name um, and give your persona a name. Yep, that's good, that works here as well. So we use Ruby as an example. Ruby is a biker in the town of Poynton. So we actually write that out. Ruby uh, is a bike rider in the town of Poynton. And she's gonna need a way to do something, okay? So here's what I want you to do. Um, this, is, this is kind of our practice template, okay? So we already know that Ruby is the person that goes in the, um, in the line here, okay? So Ruby is the bike rider in the town of Poynton. I want you to chat for me. What is Ruby or what would a bike rider in Poynton, how would we describe, how would we write what Ruby's need is, if they need, if this was a bike rider in the, in the town of Poynton, the one that we just watched that video on before the break, what does that bike rider need a way to? Go ahead and chat your thoughts on what does Ruby have, what does she need? Jeff says she needs to be safe. Riley, Ruby needs a way to safely travel through her city on her bike. Yep, good. Ruby, oh, we already said she's a bike rider. My bad, Riley, good job. Okay, anybody else? So, sounds like safe, right, is kind of our, one of our key desires, right? And where did we get that from, by the way? When we did our empathy map, right? We saw that uh, a pain was that they might not make it through there safely, or a gain is to make it through safely, right? Zaid says spend less time at intersections. Yeah, because if you're a biker, less time you spend at the most dangerous point, right? Okay, good. And so now let's, let's talk a little bit about values. What do you think um, from our map, what are the most important values for Ruby or for a bike rider. So they need a way to get through town safely because they value doing what? What do they value? You know, they value time. They value living. <laughs> okay. 
Yes, Diana, we value our lives, right? Good. Some, sometimes these are quite obvious, right? Yeah, Zaid, yeah, maybe it's just I value biking. If you take that away from me, um, you, I've lost value. And health, yep. Riley says Ruby values the space that she lives in and she wants to spend more time and wants the flexibility of how she does that, good. Okay, so what we practice there, yep, Diana, quality of life, all great stuff, okay? So what you practice there, and this is a good practice template, so I'm gonna leave this on screen because this one's clean, okay? What you practice there is naming that human that's at the center of your design. You said, here's our target customer or target user or constituent, because I realized we were talking about a town, right? But we gotta remember if some of our innovation involves the cities that we live in, we gotta know who those customers are as well, or who, who those constituents are, okay? And we, we, we answer the question, what does she desire? Or what does she need? And we really got to some ideas about what she values, okay? And sometimes you need to assume what the target customer values, especially if you don't have access to them, or if it's um, a completely new and novel thing. Okay, but other times you have the customer there with you or you ask or you interview, okay? And yes, Zaid, these could be personas. In fact, in some, depending upon how significant the process is that you go through, you may actually run multiple design statements depending upon the personas that you're trying to serve and that the personas that are in your design because many of our designs are not just for one um, segment of customers, right? So yes, these could end up either being, you could pull your existing personas if you've already had them named, you could re-pull them through this process, or sometimes what we find is that it's going through this process that an outcome is the personas. Yeah. Kieran, so, anything else on personas? Yeah, so just to be very careful, uh, many people, because they know the personas, they start with personas. In design thinking, we start with individuals. So when we do the empathy map, we put the real name, real characteristic of that person. So while doing this exercise, you need to have that real person rather than a persona. So when we do this collectively, multiple people are putting that together, Collectively, all of that will convert into a personal analysis, okay? Good. And, and yeah, so if I can just add like to that, uh, this is uh, Krishnan here, hey. So in our company, what we do is uh, we actually give specific names to people with these personas uh, and we say, hey, so a Bob's an executive who can actually write a check and so we, so we call him or her with names, so it's very personable and it's very identifiable as to who we're targeting when we are trying to sell. Uh, so it takes it from the abstract to somebody that, and maybe there's actually a Bob, uh, and we actually encountered a customer who is a Bob who fit our persona to the T, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very yeah. important to identify them as a human being than a character. Yeah, and so we will actually, as we're talking through the, some of these, both from empathy and, and definition statements, we will actually ask people in the room, do you have somebody in your life that has this problem or that has this need? Or do you have somebody in your life that, um, that you're trying to serve? And oftentimes somebody will say, oh yeah, my aunt Alice, she has this problem. And so we go with it. We say, okay, Aunt Alice is the name of our person. You know, that's the individual name that we that we um that we give that group right so and really focus on aunt alice um because you're right then you can eventually begin to extrapolate out to a broader persona group but we have to start it with the individual especially because we hope that that individual can be in the room with us when we're when we're going through these stages okay good um where are we next? Oh, well, this is good. So 
we're at the end of our session. Um, let's review. So these are the design thinking behaviors we covered so far. We talked, to, we talked about um, through empathize and define, we understand that we need to focus on people and what they do because humans are at the center of our designs. We understand that empathy first means that knowledge is not the same thing as understanding. And we have to use the empathy for our clients and our customers and our users um, very uh, both scientifically and artfully to make sure that um, that we're that we're really understanding um, their uh, their needs, uh, their jobs to be done. We talked about jobs to be done, um, really important. And then the yes and the yes and behavior is what gets us to the very inclusive process and very inclusive set of ideas that we aren't yet ready to say are bad or that they're not um, that they're not going to work. Uh, we get all of those ideas on the table. Uh, we practiced using uh, the Empathy Map Canvas. And as I mentioned, you can go out and get those um, images free. You can redraw it on a sheet of paper. You can go so far as to using, um, to using online tools like Mural. Whatever it takes to get you through that Empathy Map Canvas and make sure that you have other people involved in that. This is, it's, go it's good to practice it yourself, right? And it's better than doing it, than not doing it at all. Um, but of course, it's even better that you have diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, diversity of different roles of people that would be interacting with your product or service in the room. And then of course, the definition statement that we talked about um, just now. Um, and, and as I mentioned, if you Googled human centric design statement, you'll find maybe this statement isn't exactly um, the one that fits your product or service. Okay, so this was just one example and, and we, you can adjust the wording on that statement so that it, um, it is more fitting of the particular market that you're in. So you'll see a few examples. Don't be overwhelmed by that. It's not that one is right or wrong. It just, um, the act of making sure that you have a clear definition statement is important. The other thing, if you remember from the cyclical view of, of, um, of design thinking, is these are two sets of tools that you will often go back to. Um, because, for example, in some cases, we've seen empathy maps hung up in offices. Um, hung up uh, in some cases, you know, amongst the customer experience team or, or whomever is, is really responsible for in, engaging and interacting with customers. And even, even in a startup mode or even in a very small company, um, somebody's always in charge of making sure that we have the customer in mind. And so we'll even see these hung up. We'll see sometimes huddle meetings where we'll be going back to that to just validate, have we really gotten to the pains and the gains? So um, these are not meant to be static documents that never see the light of day. It's okay to have them out there um, and to look at them another day or after another conversation or an experience with a customer and go, huh, we didn't think of that. And go back to the map, put something up there and, uh, and redraw and adjust, just like on your definition statement. Um, don't feel like that has to be um, you know, etched in stone and that this is um, the, the definition statement. Obviously you have to have something that you're, that you're building from and so it can't be uh, completely squishy and moving all the time, but that's what um, the process of working through that gets you um, to where you can feel confident that this is a good enough definition statement to get going, okay? So, um, so next week, uh, we will get into, I believe we cover um, ideation. Let's double check. Yeah, we'll cover ideate and I believe we get into maybe a little bit of prototype. Um, obviously we can't actually prototype um, with you uh, during those sessions, but we'll talk about it in principle, what, what we do with prototyping. And then of course with testing as well. Okay, so any um, questions um, here as we close out, either you can chat those in or we'll leave the lines open. Arlene's asking, do these documents help to develop a vision statement? Uh, yes. Yeah. They do. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it helps to validate existing vision statements as well. Um, you know, when I was a consumer of this process, not just a moderator or facilitator of this process, I actually consumed this process with Kieran as my facilitator mm -hmm. and multiple times I went back and revalidated my vision statement um, because of something that we went through in these first um, stages as well. So it's okay if the vision statement comes first, these can mm -hmm. help you to adjust that or the other way around, which is as you go through empathize and define, wow, a vision statement has um, uh, begins to emerge as well. Okay. The okay. empathy map is also early and I know you, you are in business development. So within right. the business development process, yeah. uh, empathy maps mm -hmm. are phenomenally useful. I go, whenever I have a new prospect, I do the online research about that prospect without meeting that person and do mm -hmm. empathy map. When I have a meeting with the person, I do revise that empathy map after the meeting that helps me propose in the proposal state. So this is not just a tool for defi defi defining a product or service, but it, it is useful anytime you're selling a concept. If you are uh, selling your product to your customer or you have a <clears throat> very important concept that you want to, uh, a social concept that you want to com uh, communicate to the uh, so our leaders or the community. So uh, this becomes very, very important too. Yes, yes, I, I can see that. And this seems to me that it, the, this process is something for entrepreneurial startups as well as well-defined mature companies that are reassessing, maybe pivoting, considering taking on a different line of a product and or um, you know, pivoting you know, as well. Yeah. Um, but, but, but Sarah and Karan, this is, really kind of, this is part of the journey to determining if you have a minimum viable product that can be sold on mar in the market. Is that right? Or yeah. that's what I- we, we will come after we, so right now in this cycle, we are going to complete the conceptualize the product. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when we go to the next steps where we have to do the business model and test the product in the market, we do MVP. So okay. we might, I might add, uh, MVP uh, class after this one, uh, after we complete the design thinking process. But mm -hmm. the prototype and test is the component where MVP is basically uh, test, uh, used. Good. Uh, but, Good. Uh, anytime you want to do existing product and, and make changes, you may again want to go to MP, MVP process. So <clears throat> that uh, I think uh, once we go to this one and see how uh, people react, we might even add extra class just on MVP. Mm -hmm. uh, I mm -hmm. do take MVP lecture uh, at uh, Gateway or uh, uh, Vivek when we do the startup uh, uh, cohorts for the startup companies in Russia. So. Sure, sure. Excellent, excellent presentation, Sarah. Thank you so much. Really good information. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so. Diana, um, Sorry, Diana. Uh, yeah, this is a great method. Great. Diana, thank you. Good. Uh, I hope okay. you all enjoyed Sarah. Thank you very much. I know Sarah spent almost yeah. 10 hours preparing this one, though she, she can wake up and give this uh, presentation. But I know she uh, <laughs> discussed about who, who are the audiences are, uh, members are, and she has mm -hmm. shown her presentation yeah. based on that. Thank you very much, Sarah, for taking all the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Get every opportunity to succeed. Uh, Tech hope, Prize is a great uh, new opportunity for our youth happening right here in Racine. Drawing on the innovation and bold ideas of Racine's past, Tech Prize is an 11-day event that will bring hundreds of entrepreneurs and innovators from around the country to downtown Racine. There's a lot of ways kids from elementary school up to college can get involved. They can compete for cash and scholarships by sharing their new idea or invention during the idea competition. Kids with coding skills can compete to solve problems or create useful apps in the coding competition. An esports gaming competition will include cash prizes and entertainment as well. 
internship opportunities, mentorship, tech, and business workshops are available throughout the event too. If you've got a kid with a specific skill or interest in one of these Tech Prize event fields, register and get them started in something that can change their future at techprize.org.